Alex Ross, and I'm doing my first CGC signing this year. It will be the exclusive way to get my signature, and submissions are limited, so please send in your books now. When I went to art school, I was getting trained in doing paintings mostly in oils. So the only chance I had to work in watercolor or gouache was in my, what was called my fundamentals class. So uh, my school still has a fundamentals course, but I didn't have a lot of expertise or experience. I didn't take a dedicated watercolor class. I thought I should take oils and I did that for at least a year. Um, so my proficiency in that medium doesn't immediately relate to how to use this water-based media, but my, I think my lungs are better for it, not have to smelling turpentine all the time. But um, I uh, got used to, over time, trusting my own hands with how to manipulate the water-based media, and in particular, moving from watercolor to gouache, because gouache is just simply the paints of watercolor where it's got a white component mixed in so it has opacity that builds up quickly and what I found is when you lay it down thin uh, you're basically painting what is a translucent painting and the way it soaks into the paper which is like a watercolor uh, Strathmore Bristol paper that's got a, a strong tooth to it so I use like a 500 series and uh, four ply um, it, it soaks in evenly and leaves a mostly smooth texture that's not got a ton of uh, puckering and, and sort of these telltale things that will happen the way that watercolor itself will show off this sort of grit, this earthiness that I don't want you to overthink when you look at my art how it got made. I may not achieve airbrush perfection, but I want a grit that seems applicable in into a certain reality coming through but i don't want you to sit there and go oh i know for sure that is acrylic or that is oils or whatever i want you to think of the artists that i'm of course influenced by people like rockwell or james bama and um and basically i found that most of the illustrators that precede me in the history of american illustration from the 20th century a lot of them were working in gouache back in the early 20th century. A lot of the pulp magazine covers or uh, other magazine covers from the 50s, many of those were done in gouache but th before a lot of people switched over to acrylic. And I haven't found my comfort level with acrylic in the same way as gouache to me feels like the most movable. I can remove elements of it when I'm painting it thin and I don't like what I put down. I can usually put down a certain amount of water to pull stuff up or I just try and go more opaque on top of it to correct what I don't like. But for me, I've gotten to the comfort level of what I put down is largely exactly what I was hoping for. And I'm usually fairly precise, but I'm also kind of backwards in the way that I do use my media. So a lot of the things that I do are almost contradictory to the way that you would be taught to use any painting media. But... You know, at this point, it's been 30 years of working professionally. I don't know that I'm going to change. Black Panther is one of my favorite characters in comics because I think as a kid, when you first see it, you, you kind of immediately identify him as looking like Batman with the mask closed like he's Spider-Man. You don't immediately read that the ears are actually a panther's ears. They're just the little pointy things up there. And the dark blue costume is the way it was colored when I was a kid. Or, you know, you, you intellectually understood he's black, but... Or black costumed. You don't necessarily immediately recognize from aesthetically on, until you read the comics that he's an African character. And... At first, it might hit your senses as like, whoa, that's very different than me, where I might come from. But you quickly could find it like, well, that is interesting because I'm not getting that with every other character I'm reading. And it becomes more of a deepening, unique thing to follow to see his particular adventure and point of view. Because sometimes when you don't immediately identify with yourself as being that hero... It might stop you from wanting to know more, but Black Panther actually is exciting enough as a design, as a character's, for a character's background, to want to get more into 
his world, his world of experience, who he represents. And of course, he was very much used to represent the black experience in America in the comics I was growing up with in the 70s because he would come over here as a character and deal with a lot of stuff. Like I, my first Black Panther comic I got when I was seven was him fighting against sort of a version of the KKK. That's a comic I've got as a seven-year-old. You know, I thought it was really cool. He was cool. And right away, you look right on the cover, his costume is getting torn over and open. You see the brown skin, you know, but he's such an incredibly cool looking character in the same way you're drawn to Spider-Man as a cool looking guy. I also had a unique experience as a kid of going to a costume event where two guys are dressed as Spider-Man and Green Goblin. Hold on a second. And I'm the little kid wearing a homemade executioner's outfit that my mom made for me, which I was one of maybe five kids who came in costume to the event of hundreds of people in line. Um, but my mom noted to me afterwards, she could tell that the guy wearing the Spider-Man costume was black. And it was interesting to think like, wow, that is how universal these designs can be, how they can work in such a universal way that like, well, yeah, why couldn't Spider-Man be African-American? Why not, you know? And so, anyways, it's just something to relate to the entire experience of connecting with these characters and seeing how they can introduce you to a larger part of the world and make you relate more and, frankly, be more empathetic.